is the desires of the Holy Spirit. And today I'm going to be talking predominantly to myself. <laughs> Don't mean that in a schizoaffective way at all. But I'm preaching today as much for me as I am for you. Amen. And the things I'm going to say to you today apply 400 times over for me. And my hope is that my desire will be brought in line with the Holy Spirit's desire. And if anyone else's desire comes along, that's great. But out of 52 services this year, maybe one of them could be a sermon that I need. Amen. Maybe just one of them. Um, so I'm telling you about this idea, the title's More of Less. And I, I don't know if you watched this show. I think it ran for six seasons. I think on A&E, it was called Hoarders. Did anyone see that show? <laughs> yeah. It's a fascinating show. I think it ran six seasons, I read. Hoarders. And it looked at real-life people. Like, this is not like reality TV fake stuff. It's not keeping up with the Kardashians. These were real people, and, and these were real homes. And their homes became overwhelmed with an abundance of material goods. Their homes became so overwhelmed with an abundance of material goods that they became dysfunctional in the truest of words, ways. They became so dysfunctional that there was really no more place for the people. It was like their home became a storage bin. And they paid rent or mortgage on gigantic storage bins. And, and, and it was so dysfunctional that no one could live in their house. I don't know if you saw the show. I only watched it a few times because it's very disturbing to me. Because I like to collect things. I, I like to have things. Things are good for me. Only if my wife likes them, she says. We all collect things, right? Now, it's, you know, we watch these shows, and, and hopefully you watch it like, oh, that's horrifying. Hopefully you're not watching like, yeah, I know what they're going through. You know. But. It's a real disorder. It is compulsive hoarding is a real disorder. And in 2013, the DSM, if you know what the DSM is, it's the diagnostic criteria that the psychiatric community uses and agrees upon. The DSM began to list hoarding compulsion as a type of OCD. A diagnosable type that you can go lay on a couch and talk about. In fact, it's estimated that probably as high as 5% of the, the American population actually live like this. And furthermore, it leads to crippling and disabling depression, social anxiety. And fear. Fear because oh, someone may knock on the door and want to come in and there's no place to put them. Fear because I can't throw anything away because I might need it again. Fear because I have to gather all these things onto myself because I don't know if I don't have them, what if I can't get them later? You know, maybe this Tupperware container that is left over from a butter dish I finished 16 years ago might come in handy one day. 
and I might not have some place to put the leftovers. And I guess the thing I want to say about it is it's easy to laugh about it. It's easy to be disturbed about it. But it's harder to figure out where you are on that continuum. Okay? We, we may not be at this level. Maybe you are. And if you are, that's, you know, maybe the sermon's for you too. But I don't think Jesus wanted us to live like this. I don't think this is the way Jesus wants anyone to live. In fact, I don't just think that. I know it because Jesus said it. Here's what Jesus said. This, this is not our main text, but this is a supporting text. But lay up for yourself what? Treasures. Treasures. So it's good to have things. But where should you store them? In heaven. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not what? Break in and steal. And I would add to Jesus, respectively, where you don't pay a mortgage to store it. <laughs> I don't know how it gets that far out of hand, but I can relate because we all like material things. I like material things. I like stores. I like buying things. I like Kindles. I like Amazon. Who said that? Our little kids are like, Amazon, yay! I like these things. I like them a lot. I like them too much. And I like that. I can just sit down, put in an email address, put in a password. I don't even have to put in my credit card every time. I don't. Just once. It's so great, isn't it? They're so convenient for me. I mean, they don't make me put in my credit card every time, just the first time. It's so thoughtful of them, isn't it? And, 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 and now, uh, any place in the world, at any time, uh, I can just click a button and have things in one day come to me. Some places in America, you can get it instantly. I remember at Christmas Eve, Amazon was, because I love Amazon, Amazon was advertising, it's Christmas Eve, did you forget somebody? Click here for the list of gifts in your era we can deliver within the next hour. It's like consumerism and materialism has never been this easy. It has never been this sweet. It has never been this crippling. Remember, this sermon's for me. If it works for you, please. Amen. But this sermon's for me. This incessive materialism, this incessive collecting, this incessive addiction to clicking and, and needing to have things leads to living in a way that is beyond your means. And, and, and we as Christians know that this is not just a psychological disorder, but this is symptomatic of a spiritual disorder. And we know that the root cause of this disorder is fear that God won't provide for us. And we need to provide for ourselves. Now, maybe we're not as dysfunctional as the people on, on hoarders. Maybe we're not just as dysfunctional as, as our neighbors. Maybe we're not just as dysfunctional as our, our uncle who has three storage units full of stuff he will never use. Maybe we're not. But if you're the average American, according to nerdwallet.com, debt is a way of life for you. Debt is a way of a life for Americans with an overall U.S. household debt increasing by 11% over the last decade. The average American has almost $17,000 in credit 
card debt, owes almost $200,000 uh, on their mortgage, has almost $30,000 worth of auto loans, has almost $50,000 worth of student loans, and has an additional $134,000 worth of debt someplace they don't even calculate. Now, maybe you're not that person. This is just the average American. The good news is I think I found where we can get the money for health care and defense it, and everyone can get along good together. The bad news is it's maxed out. And so, I started to read this book by Josh, Joshua Becker. It's called, interestingly enough, More of Less. Now this book, Josh Becker, he is a Christian. He is a very dedicated Christian. But this book, is not written for Christians. This book is writ written for secular people. And, and one of the things I really loved about, about more of less, the, the Josh Becker book, was, was that he writes from a secular point of view, but he is not afraid to tell you what Jesus thinks. <laughs> he writes from a secular point of view, but he is not afraid to bring the Bible into the equation. And he sets out from the beginning, and he says in the very first chapter of the book, look, I am not writing to Christians. This is not a Christian book. But I am a Christian, and I don't apologize for that. So if he's not writing to Christians, who is Josh Becker writing to? Josh Becker is writing to millennials. You know what a millennial is? Our young people. You know why he's writing to them? He is writing to them to tell them, do not go into the debt of your parents. Do not try to live like your parents did. Because if you look at the average American household income and the average American household debt, you will see that what your parents did didn't work. And then he goes on to explain how much more worse it will be for them because of how much debt they're going to occur faster. Because of the rising cost of education, because of the rising cost of housing, and because the lowering of annual income. And so it's, it's a fascinating book. And he, he comes up with all these fascinating pieces of research and he says, you know, the people who watch cable TV as opposed to people who watch TV without commercials, maybe on a streaming service or so forth, people who watch cable television that has commercials are twice as more likely to be in debt than people who watch entertainment programs without commercials. You think about it. If you watch TV and you turn the TV on, instantly you got commercials like, feed the need. You got these delicious looking chicken wings and pizzas coming at you. Everybody's got nicer cars than you in the commercials. Everyone's telling you how to be the life of the party. It's just what you got on. He says interesting things that really changed the way I, I looked at many things. Like one of the things he challenged us on is how much of the average, how much the average American uses of the square footage of their own home. And it's interesting because he said things to me that just really rang true to me. Like, people have more bedrooms and more rooms in their house than they ever plan to use. They don't even go into those rooms. Now we can use technology to see which rooms we use in the house. You know, put it on our watch, put it in our pocket, and it monitors where we go, and it collects the data for over a month or a year. It tells you how often you go into which room, how often you use which space. And he points out that the average American is using about 25% of the square footage that they are paying for every single month. And he asked the question, why would we do that? Well, our parents did it because they could afford it, but we can't. So he asked the question, why do we do that? You know what the interesting answer was? Almost all of the rooms in the average American house are what we think as free storage. Where would we put our books? 
where we put this extra furniture we have. Where, you know, we need to have a room just in case someone down the road may come to visit us because it would be terrible if they had to sleep on the couch or get a hotel. And we got to have a room in case they bring somebody with them. But they really can't stay in those rooms because they're full of other stuff. And if they can stay in the room, it's okay, but they can't open the closet. And seeing some smiles of people who know what I'm talking about. He said, what if we just lived within our means? The whole book is about, what if we took the majority of the stuff in our households and gave them away? This is where he starts being all Christian on his readers. What if we took the majority of stuff in our household and actually gave, them away, gave it away to people who really need it? And what if we actually trusted God to provide for what we need when we need it instead of storing it up like Gentiles and heathens in case an emergency need emerges? That's a strong thing to say to millennials who don't go to church. He argues that maybe the way of finding the life you want is to simplify and declutter the life you have. And he begins to talk about all of the great things he and his family began to do, again, they're Christians, with their money when their money wasn't going into large cars that seat more people than are actually in their family. Or big houses that have more room than they would need if someone had a wedding in their family. And he began to talk about how they began to fund an orphanage in a third world country because it didn't cost that much in a third world country. And they were paying skyrocketing charges in urban areas to live in gigantic houses. And they began to think about what if I trusted God? God to simplify my life. It's a very biblical idea he would point out to you. After all, we all know the story of God providing for Israel, right? And manna coming down from heaven. And some of us, you know, we get the Sabbath messages in connection with the story, you know. It, it didn't come down on Sabbath and they, you know, they, they had to prepare. We, we get that story. But we miss the story about debt. We miss, we miss the story about greed. We miss the story about accumulating things you don't need. Because, come on, good Adventists, you know this story very well. Tell me what happens in this story if they try to store the manna away overnight. It rots and they wake up and it's full of disgusting worms. And I was just thinking, when I was thinking about this, I was just thinking, like, what would happen if instantly God made everything that I really don't need rot into worms? It would sure make it clear. <laughs> I, you know, I've been going, some of you know, I'm moving to a smaller place. It's, this sermon is not accidental. Like I said, it's for me. And some of you know I'm giving my stuff away. And some of you are foolish enough to take it. <laughs> Hopefully you need it, because I'm free of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm free of it. But what am I going to do in the time of trouble? Am I going to run with all these belongings? Or am I going to end up being like Lot, who didn't want to leave? And Lot's family, who didn't want to leave? Because after all, we do got the big screen TV with high optic cable internet. Like I said, this sermon is as much for me as anyone else. Maybe less is more. Maybe I don't need everything I got. Maybe I might be happier, as Josh Becker says, if I buy less things, but the things I buy are higher quality. There's a little woman named Ellen White who once said, that's how we should buy. 
maybe I don't need 50 things from the dollar store every week. Maybe I don't need to click on the Amazon instantly every time I think of something. Maybe having just a few things that are really good and really essential and really fulfilling will bring greater joy to my life than hoarding away stuff that could be used for others and advancing their life in a better way. You know, these are just some of the things I was thinking about. And I was thinking about how this connects to God's plan. Remember, what Josh Becker did is he took the money that he was spending on exorbitant lifestyle issues and he began to invest it in ministry. He began to invest it in orphanages. He began to invest it in developing countries. He began to invest it not for his own profit, but for the profit of the kingdom of God. He began to do what Jesus said. He began to make investments, but not just in himself. Yes, he keeps a retirement savings. Yes, he charges fees when he goes and speaks place. Yes, he is not living as proper. He has a very nice house and a very nice retirement plan. He's not talking about extreme. But now he has excess because he has more than he needs. And now he gives it to his treasures in heaven. He invests it into God's kingdom. He lays up his treasures in an African orphanage. He lays up his treasures in a program in South America to get fresh water to a village who has none. He lays up his treasures in giving excess stuff that just ex collect around his house. He said mostly gifts his family gives him to veterans. He will point out to you that they will come and get it. God's giving plan is about reminding us that there are things in life more important than just what you own. Giving reminds us that we are more than the sum of the things we want. Giving reminds us that we are worth more than what we can fit into the square footage of our house. And that's why we ask you to invest with us in the ministry of Solid Rock. That's why it's important that over 7,000 people are joining us this morning that they will hear, have an opportunity to hear our worship. They have, will have an opportunity to hear the sermon. And they are doing it all over the word, world. It's important when we go to the homeless shelter that we are giving back to our local city, our local area where we are. And we give to people who are disadvantaged and homeless, and we give to people who are also drug addicts and, and could work if they could get their addiction under control. And we don't discriminate, but we give to them and we feed them because this is the mission of Jesus. But how do we do that? We do that by recognizing that building our own kingdom is not the same as building God's kingdom. Amen. Building our own mansion is not what Jesus meant when he said you will get a mansion. The secret to Jesus' statement about there being a mansion is you're building it now. But you'll live in it later. And so we do have a giving plan. We have online giving, and you can give online. And I want to just take a moment and talk about that. Because I, someone actually said to me once recently, like, didn't you guys just sell a piece of property? And you have all kinds of money now because you sold a piece of property. And so we don't really need to give anymore, right? What, what do you think about that? 
I won't call names, but someone said that to me. <laughs> and and I, I won't say if they're here because I don't want everyone to start squirming. We did sell a piece of property, but just for full disclosure, we voted by vote of the church that cannot be broken to put that in an investment fund that we cannot spend a penny of it. It is saved for once we outgrow this building. So that we will be able to buy or build a building someplace else. Look around you. There's not a lot of empty seats and there's a lot of people away visiting. That's what that money is for. So some of you have also asked me, well, do we really have to talk about the tithe every week and have it in the announcement how much tithe there is? So let me just explain to you how giving works at Solid Rock and why it works at Solid Rock. By the way, this is the actual online giving form on our website that you can go to. There's tithe. For those who don't know the Adventist system, let me explain to you tithe. Tithe stays here. Oh, sorry. Wrong message. <laughs> Yeah, tithe allows me to stay here. <laughs> right message. We didn't even work that out. <laughs> tithe allows me to stay here. When tithe drops to a critical level, the denomination can no longer afford to keep me in your pulpit. Okay, it's just math. Denominations are like government. They have all kinds of money, but they really don't. So if tithe drops to a critical mass, I don't get fired. Unless it really drops bad. I get more churches added to my district. What happens when I get more churches added to my district? I'm not here. Very much, or at all or half time or less, as used to be the case. At a very minimum, we need to make what we made the year before, and we need to be growing that to keep operating at the level that we're operating at. Otherwise, they will assign me a sister church to care for as well. And it's not their fault. And you can blame them and say, oh, the conference is bad, or why would they do it? No. The only money the conference has is in your pockets. And I don't make a lot, but that's not the point. They have to pay for pastors in other places that can't afford them either. Okay, so tithe needs to be paid, and that's why there's an envelope in the, in the pew for you to give for, and that's why on the form, when you just put loose money in, who knows where it's going? I know where it's going. It's going to the local church budget. And the local church budget is good too. That stays here for local ministry. Local church budget does things like pay for going to the homeless shelter. Things like paying for the screen behind us. Things like paying for that camera I'm looking into. Things like paying um, to spread the gospel. That's what local money does. Now, let me ask a question. Which do we need better at Solid Rock? You need both. There are suggested giving rates on the envelopes. You can look at them. All I'm saying is we need to make this world a better place. And the Holy Spirit will bless us. But what if the Holy Spirit blesses us? We need to bless the Holy Spirit. We need to give back to the system, okay? So if everyone was doing their little part, and this is the thing about it, I'm not saying that anyone should sell their car or their house, although they did do that in the book of Acts, but I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if everyone did a little bit faithfully and consistently, there would never be a problem. It just wouldn't be there. 
You know, the Apostle Paul talked about this because he was having the same problem. He was trying to give the church in Corinth, try, get the church in Corinth, which, was, which lived in an affluent area, to make a donation to the church in Macedonia who did not live in an affluent area. And here's what he wrote to them. He wrote to them, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. How does that apply to us? I want solid rock to reap how? Bountifully. I don't know about you, but this is, no, i got to say this, in all honesty, not because I'm the pastor. Solid rock is the best church I have ever pastored. I want to tell you something else. I realized about a year ago when I was offered a very big promotion that Solid Rock is the best church I'm ever going to pastor. And it doesn't matter where I go or what I do next. There is never going to be a church this good. They might be bigger, they, they might be different, but there's never going to be a church this bountiful. There is never going to be a church this meaningful to me. There is never going to be a church for the rest of my career this transforming and this full of the Holy Spirit. Whenever I go, it will be because the Holy Spirit moves me. Because short of that, i got no place I'd rather be than at Solid Rock. So I want Solid Rock to be boundful. And the way for Solid Rock to be boundful is that if everyone does their part, if everyone gives their part, if everyone donates their part, it, it, you know, it doesn't matter how big your income is, it doesn't matter how small your income is. Remember the widow with two mites. All that matters is that you, what you do, you do consistently and you do faithfully. And you do cheerfully, which is the point of this passage where Paul goes on to say, each one must give as he has decided in his what? Heart. Each one must give as he has decided where? In his heart. Now women, I know it's Mother's Day. Just because the male pronoun is here doesn't mean you don't have to give. But when you give, it's about your heart. And I'm just telling you today about my heart. I'm just telling you that in my heart, I will never pastor a church like this. You could give me a bigger church. You could give me a smaller church. You could give me money and tell me to go plant my own church. This church will forever be for me home. I want it to be bountiful. Why should the house of God be lacking? Why should the house of God suffer for want? Does our Father not have access to everything? He does. Unfortunately, He made an investment in us. so that we could make an investment back in him. So Paul goes on to talk about that investment. He says, and God is able to make all grace abound where? In you. So that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in what? Every good work. If we are all faithful, if we are all truthful, if we are all of a good spirit, if we are all moved by our heart for decisions, our sanctified heart by decisions, then there will never be a shortage in God's house to do God's work. Amen. God will provide, but He needs us to be those providers. 
That's why Paul goes on now to appeal to the prophets and say, as it is written in the Old Testament, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. That was us. His righteousness endures forever. He goes on to say in verse 10, He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for the sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He goes on to say, You will be enriched how many ways? Every way. Every way. Why? He wants his ministry to be done. You will be empowered every way. You will be blessed every way. No, it doesn't mean you can go back and get the big house again and the expensive cars again and fill it up with garbage again. No, he wants to give you an abundant life that's better than that. He wants you to be the kind of people whose heart is moved for the poor because you once were the poor. He wants you to be the kind of people who care about water wells in foreign lands and care about orphanages of children you never met. He will supply the seed to the sower. He will enrich you in every way. To be generous, how? In every way. In every way. Which, through us, will produce what? Thanksgiving to God. Thanksgiving to us. It is such a joy to watch all these people watching us on Facebook every week and writing their comments, saying, praise the Lord, I'm so thankful for you guys. You know, people from Tanzania, people from Uganda, people from Kenya, people from Brazil, people from the Philippines, someone from China this week. They are praising God because of what we do here. They might be able to keep gospel preachers out of certain places in the world, but it's hard to keep Facebook out. In our last verse today, he says in verse 12, For the ministry of his service is not only for supplying the needs to the saints, but also an overflowing in where? Many thanksgiving to God. In other words, our giving is how we say thank you to God. Our giving is how we show thanks back to Him. It's not just about obligation. Remember, it's what you decide in your heart. Remember, it's to be cheerful. It, why? It's to be an expression of gratitude to the love of your Savior who has given you everything. He's giving you everything and asks for pennies back on his investment. And let me tell you, that is all we are talking about. I am not telling anyone they need to give half their income. I'm not telling anyone they need to do anything that's unbearable for them. I'm just simply saying every praise is to our God. Wow. And it needs to be more than what we sing Amen. on Sabbath morning. Me and Tina once were a part of a church that will remain nameless, nameless in this closing story. But if anyone watches this broadcast or find us on Facebook, they'll know right away where we're talking about. We came to this church that was suffering. We came to this church that was difficult. We came to this church that was going through problems. And the people began to pray. The people began to seek how they could serve God. They were in an affluent community as well. And in this affluent community, it really only took the giving of a few people to get things done. And so there's an attitude in this church. It's like, I put something in the plate and I stayed for the sermon. I'm out the door. And no one even talked to each other. It was like so cold. It was so awkward. Few people began to say things like, what if we stayed and we ate together every week? A simple thing. What, what if we broke bread like in the Bible? And, and right away, the, 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 the old guard rose up and said, are you kidding? We have special potlucks and special plates and, and we have special things that go on the table and, and we have special decorations for every potluck and we can't do that every week. And we're like, no, no, no. But what if we just ate some beans and rice? 
but then it wouldn't be special. Well, maybe we have different definitions of special. I'll tell you what. Why don't you keep your special potluck? It will be the first of the month like it always is. And, and you can go in there and get your dish and eat fast and get out the door. But what about if the rest of the month you let us eat beans and rice in here? We did. And you know what? Boom! A Pathfinder Club happened. Boom, a church library happened, and people would come back and sign out books, and boom, ministry started happening all over the place, just because people began to say, it's not about us, it's not about how big and how beautiful potluck is, not that there's anything wrong with that, but, and there can be a time for those special things, and we have those times here, but there, that was the only way you could do it, and when we started to break down those barriers, this church grew and grew and grew and grew. And I will never forget the night, because I was an elder in the church, not a pastor. I will never forget the night on the church board where the treasurer put up his hand and made a motion that we cease and desist all potlucks that were not approved by the potluck committee. Because they cost too much. And I said, how is that possible? Me and my wife are bringing the rice and beans. Well, you're using our plates. I'm like, no, we're not. Well, we just think that you're making it not special anymore. <laughs> Attendance dropped. Giving dropped. The pastor suddenly had five churches under his care. God moved me to go plant a church in a neighboring community. Two years ago, three years ago now, I was taking a class. One of my last classes I would take in my master's degree. And there was a lady sitting there. And she was from this general area. And she started to talk about this church that was devastated. She started to talk about this church that had no mission. She started to talk about this church her and her husband have taken pity on and, and, and they go over there like once a month and try to give them hope. And she mentioned someone's name, which I can't say because we're being recorded. And, and I recognize that name and I said, are you talking about blah, 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 blah? She's like, yeah, she, they, they told us that it used to be a vibrant, exploding church and they built a school they were doing so well and they were being blessed and they don't know what happened. I know. They wanted more of more, not more of less. We are at a crucial junction in our history. Our DNA is set. Are we going to be untrue to who we are? What is it that is really important to me? What is it that makes the greatest difference in my life? Is it really how many times a month I clicked the one click instant click out on Amazon? Is it really the storage bins I have to buy for storage bins because I can't store my storage bins? Is it really putting all those zeros on the end of a mortgage payment when I live alone or in a small family? The Holy Spirit is saying to me, remember, this sermon's about me, not you. The Holy Spirit is saying to me, Vinny, what are you living for? Maybe he's saying it to you, too. Marvin, will you lead us? Lord Jesus, I long to be perfectly whole. I want the tourette. Deep in my soul, break down every idol, cast out every fool. Now watch me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, yes, whiter than snow. Now. 
from your life? What is it that God wants to make whiter than snow? What is it that God wants it to be like a snowy field? Clean? Clear? Crisp? What is it that God wants us to have less stuff? That we will have room to have more of the Holy Spirit. We have two people preparing for baptism. If you would like to prepare for baptism, we would like to help you take that step. We have people who will pray for you. We have people who will study for you, study with you. If you want to help at the church, there's a place on the, your card for that. Remember the card I spoke of. We have a confidential prayer team who will pray for whatever you want and keep it confidential. I use it all the time. But all I know is God wants my life to be crisp, clear, and fresh like a field white with snow. Sing this last verse if you think that's what God wants for you. Lord Jesus, I patiently wait. Not now when we did be our create to those who have sought me. Now never said no. Dear Heavenly Father, please wash us. Please cleanse us. Please remake us. Please declutter us. Please clear our path. Please redeem us of our selfish desires. Please remake us in your simplify, simplified glory. Please help us to understand we don't need the adornments of the world. That we are beautiful. That we are complete. And we are everything we need to be when we're in relationship with you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name. Let the saints say, Amen.